Hey everybody, Mark Clayton again with Restore Cars. I turned video production of this whole thing over to the professionals, but um, today before they got here, I decided to sneak out here and show you something really cool. This is a 1935 Packer that hit a deer, and it wiped out the whole grill here, and it wiped out the, the shell, which we just straightened this up enough to fit pieces together, and I found another one that's on its way in. <clears throat> but when the deer hit, it hit here, and it went over the top and landed over on the other side and it took this headlight out and uh, pushed the bumper clear back in here and this dent right here was about this deep. So Craig, one of our metal formers, was pushing this out. <clears throat> did a great job on all that. It's normal body work, no big deal there. But what it did is it broke up this whole side of the fender and I wanted to show you him put, piecing this together. Now I was in the other part of the shop for the day getting some cars ready for, for a car show this weekend. So I missed him forming this one piece, but I caught him when he was um, getting ready to put this new piece in, and then he made a new piece down here, which I, I'll show you how he did that. So take a look. Well, this is the panel that Craig replaced. You can see some rather untidy prior restoration work, some lead work in there. But when old welds crack and break, you cannot go along and weld it again and have a lasting repair. So uh, it's just much better to make a new panel and heliarch it in. In the old days, we used to use an oxygen acetylene torch and hammer weld it. But nowadays, with the uh, great welders out there like a Miller Dynasty, we can uh, weld longer beads and uh, control our heat much better. Uh, so instead of that half three quarters of an inch with the oxygen settling welder uh, We can weld almost one inch beads But we still have to come back with our cold hammer and dolly hit that hot metal Push those slip plates back together and shrink it back down to where you need it to be We really are old-fashioned here at a road less traveled with restore cars We like a hammer and dolly and file with the file, you can tell your highs and lows so quickly and easily. So you have to knock down what little bit of weld is there. And while you're doing it, you might as well go along and planish it back out. The, I like the hammer and dolly. We also have a, an antique machine that's a little portable planisher for fenders that we sometimes use. But this methodology is great. Uh, here's the front piece that had to be replaced. A bunch more untidy prior restoration work. When the deer hit it, it cracked, and you can't weld over welds again. So uh, Craig just went ahead and made a new piece. He had already made the die for the other piece, and we're very fortunate that we have a CNC machine, and we can just make whatever profile we want. And we have these nifty little quick change things there in the Polmax where we just change the dies out. So uh, it's kind of like feeding uh, upholstery material through a sewing machine. It just kind of goes back and forth and forms up that piece of metal. Sometimes you got to stretch it a little bit on the bead, uh, but I don't think he did it on this one. It just worked out great going back and forth through the machine. Now to get it to go around the corner, you can use several different methods. Uh, Craig chose the Urco Shrinker. It's a small piece, quick and easy. Uh, you can use the power hammer or the Polmax shrinking dies to do it also. So then uh, he's got it Clecoed so that he can go back and forth and keep fitting it and make sure that it lines up with the rest of the fender. Sometimes he puts a heavy metal edge on the fender to keep it in shape before he cuts it apart. But obviously he didn't have to do it on this one. So he'll keep going back and forth. He can quickly attach it with a Clico and then uh, eventually he'll get to the point where he'll trim those pieces off to match each other. Well, after he gets everything kind of shaped where he wants it, and it's time to trim off the fender and the patch panel, he's got to use vice grips. And he's got a perfect line that he can heliarch together, uh, so he's got to use these grips. He files it and planishes it just exactly like he did the other patch panel. And just within a few short days, uh, there it is. Voila! A, uh, a fender that's all put together. It doesn't need any lead or any filler, certainly and it looks just gorgeous. Up front he's going to do a little bit of lead work so he uses a scotch bright wheel to get the metal perfectly clean. Some guys like to sandblast metal. I'm fine with that too. You just got to get it perfectly clean so your tinning compound works properly. Uh, Craig likes to use that kind of steel wool and he dips it into the uh, uh, tinning butter there and he heats up the fender 
and then he likes to brush that stuff on. Uh, that's his methodology. It works fine for him. There's nothing wrong with it. The important thing is, is that you get all the contaminants back out of there before you start applying lead. There's acids in that tinning butter that allow a thin film of lead to stick to the fender. That's all you're really doing when you're tinning anything. Uh, but you have to make sure all those acids are back out of there or they will come out eventually and they'll ruin your paint. So uh, we, we like half pound bars. Uh, we buy it by the 200 pounds at a time. The 70-30 uh, normal uh, ratio is what we use. The trick to do in this lead work is you heat your area up and then you heat the stick up so that they're virtually the same temperature. And then that lead will just flow right onto the metal. If it's too hot, it's gonna fall off. If it's too cold, it won't flow. Craig likes that soldering tip. I just use a regular oxygen settling tip with a real soft flame. And you'll see here, he, uh, it's getting a little bit too hot. You can see some of the drips down there toward the bead and uh, it ends up on the floor. Just a side note, we don't use anything that uh, hits the floor, whether it be the filings from the file or if it happens to drip down onto the floor. Uh, I don't want anything contaminated in there. It's not worth it. Uh, we properly dispose of that once it does hit the floor. So uh, patience is, is the virtue on this. If you take your time and you do really good paddle work, you're going to minimize the time that you got to file. Also, you can just move this lead to wherever you need it. Uh, I hate plastic fillers because it, it is what it is and you have to sand it off. Well, with lead, if I got my lead in the wrong spot a little bit, I can just kind of drag it over there a little bit and move it wherever it is I want it to go and be very efficient. Or if I need to add a little bit here and there, I can do that. It's no big deal. But if you take your time and you just work on doing this paddle work, get the lead to the point where it's sort of a soft butter and you can just move it wherever it is you want it to go. And with a little finesse, a little practice, you can make it look really good. It's all about heat control. That's the trick to lead work. People say, oh, I can't lead. I can lead upside down. If I control the heat, I can make that stuff just be that nice soft butter it's just perfect so after another uh, couple of days of work which seems like uh, this is slow kind of tedious work you finally get to the point where voila the magic of video we can just show you it all done but it was a tremendous amount of work but look at that result it's absolutely gorgeous well thanks for watching be sure and like and share our videos until next time take care